Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our latest productivity talk organized by the Asian Productivity Organization, where we feature guests who do interesting work at the nexus of policy, production, and technology in Asia and beyond. This is Polche Kroperyun, and I'm with the Digital Programs and Information Unit, as well as the Public Sector Unit of the APO. Relentless advances in science and technology seem to be set to transform the way we live together. The public sector is not immune from this trend and governments around the world are responding to the disruptive power of digital technology in diverse ways. How can the Asia Pacific best respond? And how does this movement towards digital government carry its own sets of risks and challenges? To talk about these things and more today, we have Dr. Antonio Weiss, an affiliated researcher with the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge and a senior partner at the PSC, a public services consultancy. His work has been featured across several media, including the Financial Times, The Guardian, BBC Radio 4, and he is an elected Labour Party councillor. He's also a published author of four books, one of them released quite recently on this very topic, The Practical Guide to Digital Transformation. Thank you for joining us today, Antonio. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So um, obviously, digital transformation in the public sector is a huge uh, topic, as I think you'll get into. So what are the main things we should, do you think we should touch on for our audience today? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question even to start with, because it can mean, even the terms can mean so many different things to different people. So if it's all right, maybe we'll have a, an early slide just to orientate our, uh, our, our members about what we will sure, yeah, be uh, covering. So, and um, I think there's, there's probably four bits that, um, hopefully will be of most interest. Uh, I'm, with all of them, we probably won't be able to go as deep as 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 uh, as we could do. But we'll try and signpost into different ways, uh, different uh, looking into them more. Maybe a few case studies, maybe a few reference points. Uh, but the four that I think will be great is just thinking ahead, because uh, you know your member organisations will always be thinking both the now, but also what's in the future. So thinking about the future of public services and where we're going. Secondly, what are the capabilities and the infrastructure requirements that we're going to need to get to that future? Thirdly, and I think it's very important for an organization like the APA to, to both celebrate and reflect on the scope for collaboration internationally, and we could talk about some examples there. Um, and then lastly, the role of the private sector, which clearly um, has, a, has a very, very important role to play um, as we move into this increasingly technological future. So those are four areas which, um, if you'll indulge me, I think will be helpful for us to cover together. Sure, sounds great. So maybe before we uh, dive into those, four critical issues, uh, we could talk a little bit about your background. So how did you come to be interested in the intersection between digital technology and government? Yeah, the, the reality is it happened slightly um, uh, serendipitously, I think is the, is the euphemism, but really just, just by chance. So I, I had a slightly varied career. So I've done lots of work in academia, particularly I started off as a, as a historian. Um, then also, um, you mentioned, uh, you know, done, I've done work in local government in the political sphere, uh, but my main focus has been in as a as a consultant to public sector organisations, central government, uh, healthcare, education. I've been doing that for the last fifteen years, and I started um, really in classic sort of strategy and strategic analytical problem solving style consulting work, which technology sort of touched upon considerations, but well, it was never really at the fore. Um, however, about five, six years into my career, um, we got a call from then relatively nascent um, organization in the UK called the Government Digital Service, inviting us to do some work helping with a, with a business case they were developing for their vision of platforms across government. And that's really my first intro to the nexus between public services and technology. Um, and I, I think one of my interesting reflections there is that a lot of people come into technology from the almost the, the top down view. So, you know, the world is changing fast, Moore's law, uh, increasing technological capacities, et cetera. So therefore, how are we going to change things? Whereas I felt I was more working on frontline public service issues um, and technology was, you know, we were, we were feeling how it was affecting us rather than having that front of mind. And that's given me perhaps a more, um, pragmatic uh, approach to that join up between technology and public services. I'd say my, my default is, I'd hope, healthy skepticism. 
Um, but I'm fascinated and I think it can afford us huge, huge possibilities. Great. And something I've noticed about this, this field, if you can call it that, uh, is that there's quite a lot of jargon or at least a lot of kind of seemingly overlapping terms, for example, uh, digital transformation, sometimes called DX, digitalization, digital states, digital government, e-government, and then even referring to specific kinds of technology, we have gov tech, civic tech, public purpose tech. So how do we make sense of all this? Uh, is it worth kind of distinguishing between these terms? I think it's, uh, it's worth, it's really helpful and important to know that the terms are just terms and that the principles um, and the outcomes that we're trying to achieve, and we'll talk a little bit about outcomes in the sphere of digital transformation in a second with a definition that I put forward. Um, but it's, I think it's really helpful to realize that they're all part of the same family. Um, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time trying to unpick each of them because I suspect some of your members may use the, di the terms differently in different places, um, but then try and show how they're common. So, you know, for instance, you know, digitization versus digitalization. In my view, they're basically the same thing. Uh, however, there is a school of thought which goes digitization is sort of, you know, putting on the, the, the E front end, making something more website friendly, whereas digitalization is the end to end transformation um, of a service. And so obviously, ultimately, that's what we should be aiming for. But some people do use the terms interchangeably. Some people share that they say that they're different. I think e government had its time, particularly in the 2000s, when there was a focus to moving at least information and static information online. And we're now thinking beyond that into digital states or digital governments. But again, they're all part of the same family. And then things like GovTech, which I feel started out as a particularly useful category for venture capital or you know, external investment to think about as a sector and to build it into something exciting. Uh, so we, of course, have health tech and med tech. Um, and GovTech was a useful term to help you know, say public sector is really, really big, you know, probably 40 to 50 percent, if not more of GDP of many economies. So we should be focusing on it as a category for technology investment and development. Uh, but it's since evolved to be something a bit broader and public purpose technology is, is really meaning any technology that's out there to serve the public good. And that is usually driven by public services, uh, but not necessarily always so in many countries, you know, higher education institutions are public goods or public services, I would say, uh, but are actually privately owned and controlled. Um, and then civic tech, which you mentioned as well, civic tech is more, I feel, to do with democracy and enabling more citizen participation in the running and governing of states. Uh, and the way that people tend to do that tends to be by more collaborative approaches, so hackathons, use of open source technologies. But again, it's, it, it's all in the, all of these terms for me, are, you know, if you think of a Venn diagram, there's public services or public things, um, there's technology or digital technologies, and there's a mix between the two, and they sort of sit in that intersection. Uh, and I, I, what I'd stress to, to those, uh, you know, to, to your member organizations and those working in at this nexus is don't let the terminology make you feel excluded or that somebody is talking about something that is different to how I talk about it, therefore I can't engage in the debate. It's all very, very similar. And oftentimes I feel terminologies are used to try and you know, create a common language, but the common language ends up being exclusionary um, when really we want it to be participatory and we want as many people to be involved as possible. And um, if it's all right, I might, I might venture the, the, the critical kind of question about digital transformation, uh, an early, um, my attempt in my in my new book to to try and translate that into something meaningful so i've got some uh, sure, uh slides on that uh, so if i just nudge it along and um, there's quite a lot here um but i think it's important to reflect that digital transformation covers a lot so i've underlined what i think are the critical sort of terms here but firstly it's about using all of the things that we might consider to be digital technology so technology which is commonly assumed to be hardware and infrastructure, um, data, which is, of course, you know, fundamentally the ones and zeros, but the information I would suggest that sits underneath uh, technology. And then digital services, which you know, people often think of as the things that you can't see, so the software. But it's all of those things together 
uh, is what digital transformation comes for or encompasses, sorry. Um, and I think that it's transformation is about making things better. And that sounds like a really potentially anodyne point, but it, I think it's really critical to understand what that means. So doing something better means understanding, well, how are you doing it now? How do you evaluate whether what you're doing now is good or good enough? And can you be confident that some of these digital technologies or data or services will make the future better? Because sometimes they won't. Sometimes they'll exclude more uh, citizens or residents uh, than they did before. Sometimes they'll actually be more expensive because new technologies have a high uh, cost and they may not scale easily. So you need to be confident and you can never be certain they're going to make things better. Um, and by better, I would say be more user centered or perhaps more human centered. In other words, serving human needs as opposed to bureaucratic or organizational needs, uh, being more secure. And I think we'll, we'll touch upon cybersecurity in a bit, but cybersecurity is, I would suggest, you know, the, the, you know, the dominant uh, consideration that we should have in terms of crime of, the, of this new era. That is where crime is growing. That is where cr most countries, you know, crime is actually now about identity fraud and identity theft and that a lot of that lives online. So how do we make things more secure and how do we make sure that they deliver more value to the people and the shareholders and the society that we have them before? And again, that comes back to thinking about well, what is valuable to citizens, to residents, uh, to shareholders, and how can technology help do that? And if it's not going to necessarily improve uh, on the value side, then should we really be doing it? Um, so it, it's quite all encompassing, but I think it's importantly that uh, because I don't, what I would be very worried about seeing is for digital transformation to become siloed. So we have, you know, the data people over there, the digital service development people over here and the hardware and technology people over here. And if we create those silos again, which I think historically lots of IT and ICT has had, um, then we won't really maximize the potential for, you know, for the technologies that are uh, rapidly becoming commonplace and will soon become available as well. Great. Well, since we're already talking about kind of what we don't want, maybe the future of digital transformation to look like, you can you can tell us about your thoughts on what what you think uh, the future of government and public services will look like or should look like when it comes to digital technology. Yeah, of course. And if I may start um, with almost like the first principles for why why I think it matters sure. uh, that across the world adapt to this new technological change. I mean, so the, 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 the obvious point is that if you, well, so I think nation states get a lot of their legitimacy from delivering good services to uh, the people that live in them. And if you have a big change in how life is lived in the private sector, but either be that through e-commerce, be that through matching platforms, be that through even just you know the communication that we're going through now, if you have a big uh, gap between the private experience and the public experience, be it in healthcare or education or other forms of social services, um, if you have a big gap, I think there risks being a questioning about the, the legitimacy about how the nation state operates. Um, you know, taxation is obviously is, you know, a large part of, of, of people's lives and concerns. Um, and if they feel that their taxes aren't being spent in an effective way um, for the delivery of public services, and if they feel there's a gap emerging between the private sector experience and the public sector experience, I think we have a big problem that will emerge. So, for me, this strikes to the heart of you know, what it means to have an effective country and governance and an and operating mechanism uh, in society. So that's why I think it's so important that we get this right. And in terms of where are we going now? So um, I'm, I, might, I might share actually another slide, if that's all right, just to talk about the journey that I think we've been on so far and where we might go. So very simply, and this is something that you see across um across the world but obviously there's nuances i'd say in the from the sort of the 2000s onwards we went to the first phase of digital public services which i would say was pretty static information giving and by that it's sort of you know web 1.0 to 2.0 it's websites so information given or made available to people 
via static websites. People couldn't necessarily interact with that information beyond reading it and taking it away and doing something with their lives uh, with that information. We then, from the sort of 2010s, moved into a greater focus on transactional services. So you know, how do I get my passport? How do I get my driver's license? Uh, how do I register a birth or how do I register a death? And that involved both uh, you know, usually a, a website, um, but also a, a person interacting with that website, giving some information, having some information processed and getting something back at the end of it. And that's the transactional nature. And I think you know, we're, we're, not, we're not finished on getting the static right. There's still a lot of information which uh, people need to know from their governments, which isn't easily findable online. So we haven't completely solved the static. We definitely haven't solved the transactional um, because whilst lots of high volume transactions in countries across the world are now online, lots of them still aren't and you still need to turn up in person, you still need to sign documents and you still need to prove how you are by you know, looking at someone and doing what could be probably done as a biometric test via technology. Um, but we're now moving into a third phase uh, and you see this particularly in, in countries that are perceived to be uh, particularly leading. And I would say that's proactive services. So before both static and transactional have been fairly reactive, it's required a person to look for the information or to try and you know, complete the transaction. I think we're now going to move into a phase of proactive, personalized services where the state might say, for instance, you know, we saw, you know, but as, as a common, um, as a common occurrence, let's say, you know, we know that you used X toll road, we have your direct debit account or something, we are now going to um, take money away from using that, from, you know, we're gonna charge that toll road usage. Or we know that you have undergone X medical treatment, it's important that you then adhere to the rehabilitation that you have. Here is a reminder to, uh, to ensure that you do that and maybe here's some data that we want from you to check that your rehab is going well. And I think that it's that phase of, proactive personalized public services underpinned by technology that we're now moving into and will be become almost the, the expectation over the next probably the next generation great thank you I, th I think that's very helpful for kind of structuring our conversation about this um would you be able to name maybe some specific agencies or countries that seem to be leading in this area that seem to be embracing the kind of proactive role of digital government yeah, of, co of course, of course. So I, I think, I, I mean, Estonia is commonly uh, held up as, a, as an exemplar in this area. And I think that you know, there's, there's slight problems there in that Estonia is, is, is brilliant on many levels, particularly on e-government, but it is obviously a smaller uh, a nation state. And so you know, it's not necessarily would, would all the parallels be appropriate, but Denmark as well, uh, Korea, the Republic of Korea as well, uh, you know, look to particularly where, you know, where I'm sitting in, uh, in the UK as real pioneers. And I think they are all focusing um, on those personalized proactive services that I mentioned, but doing so in a, in a very data driven way. And a lot of that rests on the fundamentals about how do you get the building blocks of infrastructure and data together so that you can create personalized services upon that. So in Estonia, you've got the EID scheme which also links to health insurance information, unemployment information, um, social insurance as well. And those data sets are joined together and you're able to link them and then create services which then push out information to, to, to citizens. Um, the other thing which I think many of those leading digital nations have uh, in common is that they try and build in consent for the use of data uh, throughout everything that they do. So uh, in Estonia, for instance, it is possible for somebody to check when their, it's quite easy in fact, to check, you know, when their data was last accessed, by whom, uh, at what time, and, you know, hopefully it will be clear for what reason. And that transparency allows, I think, a lot of concerns that could arise about, well, why is my data being used and who has this data um, and how's it, you know, being processed. Uh, that transparency and that you know, concern for consent helps to make uh, a lot of this possible. Right. And I, I think we'll get into uh, talking about data and talking about consent a little bit later. Um, just to describe the APO perspective, uh, our various members, I think you could probably guess, 
occupy different stages of, of the digitalization kind of steps that you outlined earlier. So for the for these states that maybe are quite early on in their digitalization journey, maybe they're still trying to figure out the, the static elements, what would you say are, are there low hanging fruit that you think are relatively easier to implement, but might have very significant dividends in terms of them being able to better deliver public services or to better organize themselves internally? I think it's a, a great question. I'd, I'd say there's, there's probably three uh, categories of um, improvements with varying degrees of, of low hanging fruits within them. So the, the first is in the, the processes, the second is in platforms or common, commonly done things by governments, and the third is in procurement. So on processes, I think it's really um, important to to get their low hanging fruits. Think about a combination. You know, what are high volume transactions? Things that happen all the time, day in day out, that gets processed by the government that either are duplicated, so uh, you know, uh, local or regional um, uh, state uh, offices do them the same thing but slightly different. Could those be you know, uh, deduplicated and done once and done well? Or processes which are just very uh, cost intensive and cumbersome and require lots and lots of manual intervention. So think about those processes, get a good handle about what they are, and then work through and say, well, which are the ones which we could get a good return on the investment from addressing? And uh, things that people have commonly looked at first will often be getting passports because um, there's quite a lot of, uh, you know, going, uh, there's quite a lot of money and time that's expended in resources improving uh certain information or providing certain information if you can get passports done that can cover quite a lot uh driving license or other ones as well but think about what are your common processes that get done um and work through you know which ones could you get a good return from from addressing early on the second area is in common platforms so are there things which actually we could just do once for the whole country um, and that would save a lot of money and hopefully save a lot of time for, you know, uh, for, for residents so that they can you know, get used to a consistent form of how something works. And the, the most obvious example there is on having a single website. So from uh, Argentina through to the UK, through to uh, you know, countries across the world, in many instances, the first big technological change has been, can we just have a common website for most government information? Usually people don't, uh, aren't able to do all government information, but that means you can deprecate and remove old websites. That means that you don't need as many people working on keeping information up to date because it's all in one place. That means that you might be able to save money on some hosting and, and uh, um, maintenance and upkeep on websites. So that, that those platforms, there are other platforms that come over time, but I think websites is a really good one to, to think about first. And then the third category is in procurement. So every country spends an enormous amount on their public services, uh, and an, a huge chunk of that will be on other organizations to help deliver it them. That could be third sector, private sector, sometimes even uh, you know, other government departments providing services for those government departments. But looking at your technology spend very clearly um, and trying to, insofar as is appropriate, centralize some of that buying is a real low hanging fruit. So particularly in the UK, the, the biggest savings that came from the government digital service in its early years, which is perceived rightly so to be you know, still a leading example of uh, state digital transformation. The biggest savings came not through uh, gov.uk, the website, which was still great, but it came through something called spend controls and the digital marketplace. And that effectively said, um, you know, there is a central body which is going to be the singular place where if other government departments want to spend money on technology, this central body will review, you know, does it meet our principles and best practice standards? Uh, does it provide value for money? Uh, are we you know, using buying power and aggregated power effectively in procurement? And by doing that, a huge amount of both money can be saved, but also better technology buying solutions can be done because uh, as we all know, lots and lots of different technology suppliers doing uh, the same thing for different people ends up creating infrastructure challenges. So I'd say processes, I'd say platforms and say procurement, each of those have low, low hanging fruits within them.
Right. That's very interesting. Um, I want to drill down a little bit on procurement. So you mentioned that, you know, one of the uh, most significant kind of cost saving measures that the UK government was getting this spend control uh, program up. I'm wondering, do technology suppliers for governments, do they tend to be local or are they international? Because obviously their concern is always with kind of uh, private citizen information, et cetera. I'm wondering to what extent does healthy procurement practice in governments rely on there being a kind of local market or local set of suppliers to kind of offer these sort of core technologies? It's a good, it's a good question. Um, I mean, there's, there's always going to be a, a bit of a mixed economy. There is a move um, which is growing, what we've seen in the EU and we've seen in the, in the US, towards a greater data sovereignty, which requires data, particularly uh, you know, sensitive state data, to be held within the shores of the country from which the data is got. And that requires either local suppliers or large multinational suppliers with bases in that, that host country. And that's... Um, that's a that's an additional complexity, um, but I think it can be either. The important thing is that whoever the supplier is, um, well, it, it sort of works from the, the both the buyer and the supplier side. So I think the buyers need to be comfortable that if you are, you know, let's say you're buying a, uh, let's say a, you know you have a local government organisation that's. Uh, wants to deal with complaints around refuse collection or indeed you know wants to be able to, uh, um, to provide a service to residents where refuse collection can be pinpointed i think it's down to that buyer to not be too um fixated that their processes need to be set in sand forever uh, and they need to be flexible to a supplier coming along and say well actually we we do uh, you know we provide the technology solution this for another country which looks a little bit different to your solution uh, how you currently provide things, would you be willing to change your processes um, in order for us to provide the solution? Sometimes buyers say, no, you have to do it exactly as we've specified. And I think that then increases cost because there's customization. Um, so I think that's one challenge. The other challenge that needs to be overcome is that the suppliers still need to be sensitive to local uh, issues, whether that's local laws or regulations or just differences in how um, demographics and residents mean that people interact with uh, technology. Um, so you need a little bit of both, and I think the, the reality is that it's a, um, there's a, there's a bit of art of the compromise that goes on. But it's possible to provide, it's possible for you know small to medium sized enterprises to provide brilliant uh, technology services at a at a national scale level. It's also possible. Uh, for large multinational suppliers to provide brilliant localized services as well, um, so I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't say you know it's an either or. Right. Thanks. And maybe we should talk a little bit now about um, before you know talking about what the future of government looks like. What are the kind of necessary components? So um, maybe you could just break it down for us. What what sort of infrastructure is essential for digital government? It, may, it might be helpful because we're, we're sort of moving on to the uh, second chunk sure. of capabilities and infrastructure that, that we mentioned. If we if I flick up another slide, if that's all right. Yeah, and, please. Um, so this is uh, something that I, I kind of use quite a lot, and it's in the in my new kind of writings and thinkings about a very simple technology stack for you know it could be a company creating widgets, could be a software as a service provider it could be a, a government and, and my point is that these are all common things that you need to think about uh so at the basic level so at the infrastructure layer you need to think about well where is your data hosted uh and stored and how do you ensure that that's you know meets your regulations or indeed meets changing uh concerns in due to geopolitical issues so we've seen with uh the ukraine conflict um uh, there's talk about moving service to other countries, particularly Poland and France, and thinking about infrastructure there. Then thinking about, well, what's the data that sits in that hosted infrastructure? And importantly, I would say best practice means, well, being, can you be clear, like, what are your registers of information? What are the common things that you uh, need to know in order to make your services run? And where do they sit? 
Then on top of that, there's you know what you might call the business logic layer. In you know in some organisations, people might call middleware. Uh, often ends up being developed by application programming interfaces. But how do you access that data and join it up appropriately so that you can create either applications and by applications that's everything from um, you know uh, web-based uh, apps and websites uh, through to native uh, smartphone apps through to even things like you know quantum computing uh, which is a, a big consideration in the future how does that all flow into your applications and how do those applications interact maybe with end user devices which might be uh, you know, devices which are provided to uh, civil servants or public sector workers or indeed students. And so you need to consider it through each of those, you know, what is the what are the capabilities that you require for each and who's going to provide them? And then how are they going to interact with your users um, and how can they act them? And then on the right hand side, I, I, the, the critical point about these is that you need to think throughout how do you make sure that cybersecurity runs throughout all of the different layers and how do you have all of the requirements in place to ensure that you are protected and when an attack happens because attacks you know are daily and when will it will only increase in scope that you have the appropriate uh, mechanisms in place for disaster recovery plans or indeed mitigations for, for business continuity and then also on the right thinking about well what's the service management so um, you will often have suppliers, well, you'll always have suppliers, but they might be internal or external uh, who provide, you know, who update your application programming interfaces, who, you know, make sure that applications are maintained, uh, who ensure that your data is available and, you know, 24 seven. So what's the service management that goes around that and how do you access it? How do you, um, how do you manage your contracts? All of those need to be considered. So um, across all of those, one of the big points coming back to my earlier definition of digital transformation is it will be very easy to say, oh, well, the data layer needs to be something that the, the data people worry about. The infrastructure layer needs to be something that the technology people worry about and so on. And I'd say that is how you create problems for yourself. So you need to have uh, a guiding mind throughout all which says, how does this interact with our entire needs and how do our different choices um, join up to be you know, more than the sum of their parts. So if I'm someone in government that's interested in digitalization and, you know, I look at your chart and I see, you know, there's so many kind of different components to it. How, what is a workable model that, that some states have done to kind of, you know, not be siloed, to not have, oh, just a data team working on one end? Because I think there's a tendency in government, of course, to, to work in silos, you know, just having all the work being held in different agencies uh, across different ministries, for instance. Uh, how, how is there a kind of coordinating function to, to handle all of this? Yeah, so I, 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 my answer is um, slightly problematic and what we might touch upon, you know, um, uh, something we might want to discuss later, which is how do you ensure that there is enough uh, of the local uh, or the particularly or you know you factor in local needs but if you think of any of the large technology players uh, you know, from methods it's a salesforce to whomever um, customization and tweaking is you know is is, is, the, is the enemy of, of productivity and so I think the answer for governments has to be having a very strong clear uh, well mandated central guiding body, that draws together these multidisciplinary functions and needs and takes an overarching view of what's required um, for the infrastructure. And usually I would say that's a strong, um, you know, that requires strong political leadership, that requires a well-resourced organization that has a mandate to um, assist, if not necessarily uh, tell other parts of the state infrastructure, well, this is how you need to run and these are the standards and protocols that you need to adopt and it has within that individuals with the requisite capabilities and experience uh to know you know what works and how to make things work and oftentimes that will mean that they have to be paid you know uh, comparable to high paid private sector uh technology organizations but i think having a really really strong guiding mind and central body that's well resourced and has um as I say, the political leadership to say, 
this is the way that we're going to do things is really, really important because otherwise you have you know, a fragmented system where nobody's really in charge. There's no necessarily common standards that people agree upon. Um, and that creates duplication, that creates problems, and that creates easy entry points for things like cyber attacks. Right. Well, mentioning kind of disaggregation, one of the pieces of infrastructure that I think we, we discussed off air, uh, and I'd love for you to elaborate on is the role of digital identity. So it seems to be kind of central for a lot of, you know, the delivery of digital public services. And I think you discussed that there are kind of different models at play across different countries. Uh, could you could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so um, one of the trends that we're seeing is that those countries, is that there's, everyone knows that digital identity, and this is true in the private sector as well, and if you see, you know, where the, the venture capital investments and tech funds have gone, a huge amount has been growing very, very rapidly in identity verification. Um, but I think everyone knows that in order to harness uh, the power of technology to provide better services for citizens by joining up information and doing it in a personalized, proactive way, as I said before. And that requires some way of identifying uh, a person to a need. Um, and the two most distinct models are uh, between countries that have um, sort of foundational existing citizen identity databases um, and those countries which which don't, for instance. Uh, and so, you know, pretty much those countries which don't, we, we say that they're more, they have to build their identity schemes on, on a functional basis. So they're building, you know, uh, based on uh, driving registers or health registers or other registers. And so those functional countries are pretty much the US and the UK. And there are many, there are others, but they're the biggest ones. And the foundational states that tend to be most other countries. Um, and that provides slightly different ways of developing services. If you have a foundational canonical, and by that I mean you know, it's the one place of the truth, if you have a foundational database of your citizens, which is you know, well protected and there's consent built in, then it's much easier to join up services around those, those individuals. Um, if you don't have that, then you have to find ways around that. A lot of that tends to be data sharing agreements between departments to then create, uh, you know, keys to link back to a citizen. But that that adds complexity. Um, but it's just a function of well, it's a it's a it's the reality of working in an environment which doesn't have that um, sort of foundational uh, data set. And I think those are two models. Though we're, we're both are trying to work towards the same goal of personalized proactive services. But are having to do things in quite different ways because of you know, cultural history and uh, technology infrastructure. Right. So to kind of link it all back to to the concerns about data, uh, and I might be venturing a little bit into like sociological uh, speculation here, but my my kind of intuition about why particular governments, the U.S. and the U.K. you mentioned, have this sort of cultural history of being um, suspicious of the idea of having kind of a central identity document is a little bit linked to the idea that, you know, there's a kind of feeling that the government should have sort of limits in what it, what it knows about citizens. And there, I think there's also a concern about governments, what they might be able to do with kind of data, citizen information. So, and that always seems to be a perpetual concern when it comes to the use of technology and government in general. So how can governments sort of establish uh, trust and be transparent with data? And how, sh how should they think about um, working with data in general? It's a, it's a really, really well, 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 well put question. I mean, I think there's two elements that really need focusing on. So one is creating mechanisms that allow um, trust and transparency to be easily exercised. So I mentioned Estonia, but other countries do this as well, um, giving individuals the ability to see how their data is used, as opposed to actually being told how it's going to be used. So everyone has you know, been through the various disclaimers about data being used, and whilst over time you know, they're, they're getting a little bit clearer, they're very long, they're very cumbersome, very few people actually read them. Um, 
So, uh, so I don't think that necessarily builds trust. In fact, I think that tends to make people think that there's something to hide. But actually helping people understand and see how you can see how your data has been used and allowing them that that facility is one mechanism. So building in functions that allow uh, transparency, which then should engender trust is important. But the other one, which I, I think is just underappreciated, is that you have to have um, political champions, so people who are willing to face into the difficult um, conversations which go, which need to go something along the lines of, we do understand many of these concerns, um, we're not sort of deaf to them, we do appreciate that there, there may indeed, there, there, there probably will be instances where things don't go quite right because that's the nature of you know any large organisation, public or private sector. But we're aware of the risks. We're mitigating against them. We're doing everything you know possible, openly and clearly. And most importantly, here are all the reasons why there's great benefits to be had. That either through improved research, better planning and care for service, uh, planning for and management of services, and indeed better delivery of services. You know, these are the ways that we're going to improve your lives by doing these trade-offs, um, or by using your data in certain ways. And I think having people making that. Uh, those points openly to the public is really important because otherwise it just uh, it, it 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 leaves the space for debate open to the critics rather than to the proponents. Um, and I think people need to humbly accept that there there are risks from doing that, but there are also risks from the way that we currently capture data and use data, and there are risks from the way the private sector does that as well. And you know we just need a, a balanced approach to understanding what those risks are um, and how we get the best out of them. Great. I, I think that was very well put. Um, being based in the UK yourself, having involvement in, uh, you know, the UK political parties, what, what would your guess be? Do you think there's a, do you think there's a chance that the UK adopts a model of digital identity more similar to maybe uh, its neighbors in, in continental Europe? Or do you think it's kind of, you're, you're pretty set in place now? I think it's uh, I think it's unlikely. I think it's unlikely. I, th I think I mean one of one of the, the the challenges that many countries rightly now you know face with you know rising inflation across the world or you know reduced economic growth in many many countries is it's it's un it requires political capital uh, you know to be expended to make the argument and it's rarely the most rarely seen to be the most important thing that politicians want to spend their political capital on and i think that's true right now in the uk uh, and so even though there are lots of you know brilliant great people working on improving digital identity um, i think most of those efforts will go down that, that sort of uh, functional model and, and hopefully you know they, we can get to a useful workable solutions through that but i i don't see a huge appetite uh, either politically or socially for, for um reopening some of those debates which were quite big about 20 years ago but you know I'm, that's just me opining i don't i don't i i i you know, I, I could eat my uh eat my hat as the expression goes in due course sure so i i want to move on soon to talk about uh, international linkages and that sort of international dimension to digitalization but one thing that you did mention that i thought it was worth asking about is you talked about the importance of the role of role of champions, and that's something I hear a lot. Uh, implementing various programs to the APO, we often introduce a kind of sexy new public sector reform technique or or method, and we talk about well, to do this, you're going to need a champion, and it's something I've been thinking about recently because, of course, it, it, in some ways it seems sort of anodyne or obvious. Of course, you need someone at the at a high level to kind of push through change if you want serious change in, in the public sector. But at the same time, it often, it sort of leaves any kind of change very exposed politically because champions come and go, especially at, at the level of political leadership. It sort of, in some ways it constrains um, changes in, in digitalization in government to be kind of subject to, for example, electoral cycles or political windfalls. So do you, do, how do you think about the champion approach. Am I right to be a little bit skeptical? I think I think you're right to be maybe I'd suggest cautious. Uh, I am so I, I think there's definitely risks with it being the champion approach being too invested in a singular individual and definitely risks with it being invested in a singular political party. 
Um, and I think the more politicized the change seems, the riskier it is, and, and, unless you have a very long standing you know, political administration. But even then, you know, that, that, that's risky. So you know, the best approach I would suggest would be to build both a coalition, ideally politically, but that's going to be very hard, but a, a, a coalition of willing uh, ambassadors, champions for the approach from different sides of maybe a political administration or potentially from others. Um, and you can you can get that certainly in the UK. You know, there's, there's actually quite a lot of cross-party parliamentary working which goes which goes on, particularly at committee level, to so trying to build champions at the political level. But then I'd also strongly suggest it's actually about building champions at an institutional level uh, in the permanent bureaucracy in the civil service in particular, and they are you know supposed to be there to outlast political administrations. And I think that's something that requires a lot of uh, care and nurturing and consideration um, and so you know making sure that you have them on, on both the political and the administrative level are, are are the best recipes for success but it's still going to be hard and you're, you're absolutely right to, to to have some some concerns I think because it's you know, the nature of politics means that the desire to change or continue and if it's changed then how do you how, how do you ride that that uh, that that sentiment Right. Um, so one of the interesting pieces that were put that was put out by the Bennett Institute for Public Policy uh, covered the trend of digital mini lateralism, which I hadn't heard of before. Um, could you could you maybe expand explain first explain that term to the audience for people that like myself wasn't sure what it was and why it might be something that they want to pay attention to. Yeah, of course. So this is something that I did with Dr. Tanya Filer, at, um, who's a good friend at the, uh, at, the, at the Bennett Institute. And I think it's really, really be- relevant for, you, for yourselves, for APO members. So the, the concept of mini-lateralism, is, mini-lateralism can be seen in, in distinction to multilateralism. So, you know, where we have big multilateral agencies, such as the, the UN or World Bank, mini-laterals, by contrast, are what we describe as sort of small, trust-based, innovation-oriented networks that of, of, of nation states, and we looked in particular at the digital nations, which originally started the D5, which is sort of the, the, the self-ascribed leading digital nations of the world. And, and we looked at, well, how do they work together? What do they do and what benefits do they bring? Um, and they work together on both a political level and an administrative level. So you get those two levels of linkages. You have formal sort of set piece summits, which meet uh, yearly, but then you also have informal, constant, dialogue and communication at a, at a working administrative level between digital practitioners and digital policymakers. And the really important thing there is that because they're, you know, as we would say, trust-based, people are willing to share failures and knowledge and challenges and successes in a quite a quick fire rapid way. And so, uh, you know, it's through use of you know, common social media platforms, you know, like, like WhatsApp, that a lot of these groups will share information, convene um, you know, small chats quite regularly and be able to, to work on issues. So they work particularly on kind of you know, good practices for technology procurement, uh, principles for AI deployment, or indeed common standards for digital services. Um, and they're able to, outside of the more um, potentially slower moving multilateral organizations basically pick up the phone to a you know a friend in a, in a in a in a country facing a similar challenge and say well how do you deal with x and i think for me one of the best examples of some of that was around code sharing so open source code sharing for particular platforms so estonia's um, x road crossroad platform is a great sort of foundational um uh sort of piece of straight in state infrastructure the uk's UK notify service, which sends out now billions of messages to citizens. Um, both of those are open source code. And what you found in the digital nations, many lateral groups is that people from, you know, from in, in, in uh, various countries in Canada and the UK and elsewhere would say to each other, hey, we've seen your gov.uk notify code. We want to fork it. Can you, you know, can you help here? Just you know, tell me, how did you do it? What are the things that you need to watch out for? Can we maybe talk to some of your tech teams? And that all happens in quite a rapid, quick fire way. And I think it's a great example of, sort of you know, knowledge sharing and ch- meeting common challenges together. And I suspect lots of those good practices are things that you and your members already do. 
um, but it's sort of giving it a name and trying to understand well, what works and what maybe works less well from from those mini laterals. Mm. So I think that that sounds very positive, very interesting. And if if the APO isn't explicitly engaging in, in this sort of initiative, I think it's something that we should definitely look into and that we should definitely help try to facilitate between our, our member governments. Um, I do want to talk about a potential complication to this kind of trend of, of digital cooperation between governments. Um, something that I've observed is that uh, maybe maybe tied to a view that technology is sort of neutral, is that when governments import or export kind of technology, specific pieces of technology or technology management frameworks to and from one another, um, it seems to me that alongside the actual packages of technology that are being exchanged, there's often an underlying ideology around the use of technology that's shared as well. So maybe you can look at something like, you know, the Brussels effect with the EU uh, sort of exporting its standards around privacy. Um, or you can look at kind of the People's Republic of China, which at least in the Asia Pacific has been exporting uh, surveillance technology to other countries. So is this something that governments, uh, not just in across the Asia Pacific, but maybe globally should be more concerned about this kind of, this imp- Implicit philosophy that's sometimes uh, imported or exported along with the technology itself. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right, and I think that the starting point is to you know you hear, you hear a lot from Silicon Valley sort of acolytes that our technology is neutral; it's all about the deployment. I don't think that's true at all. I think technology is built by humans um, with certain uh, thoughts and processes and practices. Um, you know reflected in the technology and then it's you know trained on data which will re- reflect the biases probably of the society from which that data takes so i think it's really important as you say to be clear about or well, to try and think through well what are potentially the ideologies or risks that we're bringing here and you mentioned two which i think are very very pertinent um and and that's why particularly for the mini laterals that we looked at and did, digital nations have been the, the prime example um they set out and have a quite a rigorous um, approach for, for new members joining, which has to be that they hold what they deem to be common values in terms of how they you know, how they work as societies. And I think that is an important consideration when factoring in, you know, and therefore can we take some of this technology uh, on board. Um, the one thing I would say is that even then, um, there are just important caveats to have in mind so particularly in the in the uk so england and wales have ostensibly you know this very very similar setup with their national health service uh, in wales there were uh, there was a desire to fork the code for the covid19 nhs app and use that the code from england um, but it wasn't directly transferable because the way that the primary care of gps and others is set up in wales looks slightly different to england and so even then where you think it should be fairly simple uh, to take things and just run with with uh, the technology, actually, quite a lot of uh, changes needed to be made, and that's not necessarily an ideological change. Although you could argue there's some ideology about how uh, you know health systems should work, um, but there were differences there. So I think you know, as with all these things, it's important not to have a uh, a slightly naive view that you can just lift and shift and everything will be fine, even with very very similar seeming sort of nations. Mm. So I want to finally get to the sort of last critical issue that that you mentioned earlier on. So the role of the private sector and how it relates to this kind of trend of digitalization. So um, another thing that I think we discussed off air was that the GovTech sector and sort of GovTech ecosystem, if you can call it that, seems to be rapidly growing in the UK and, and across Europe in general. So maybe you could talk to us about how uh, this sort of trend is sort of influencing the idea of processes, platforms, and procurement that you that you mentioned earlier on? Mm, I, I mean, I think it's a great, it's great to see that it is changing. I and mean, clearly, the private sector has an enormous role in these technological advances. Um, I think where GovTech works best or public purpose technology works best is where there is a healthy nexus between uh, sort of the buyers. So and by Gov, I mean, really all public services. Um, between those, you know, entities which may start off as startups but quickly scale into, you know, unicorns like Babylon, uh, and then research universities and institutes which help to build upon uh, 
uh, some of the knowledge from both and share new knowledge as well. Um, and it's about those three working together um, to define problems clearly and try and solve problems together. I think that's where it's really effective. So there were, for a few years in the UK, there was something called the GovTech uh, scheme where effectively governments would say, we are, government departments would say, we are dealing with X problem. We would like to put forward some money so that private sector startups could try and solve those problems with us. Uh, and a particular kind of encouragement for, for research-based universities or institutes to, to also play a part in that. I think that's a great example of you know, trying to match up both the capabilities from the private sector with the needs of the public sector. And I think that's where GovTech can really um, accelerate and move forward. I think my concerns with any anything, um, any kind of you know, ex-tech industry is again, it's this lift and shift consideration. You know, the public sector and the private sector just are different. Uh, there's you know, public services need to be universal, which means you can't kind of filter out particular uh, uh, user bases, um, which many technology organizations would want to do, because of course, uh, many user base or user categories can add cost and complexity, but you have to serve all of them. So that's different. So you need to work together to deal with that. The risk calculus is different because something goes wrong in the public sector, it's going to be all over the news, it's going to be all over the public accounts committee, you know, uh, there's going to be criticism from everywhere. If it goes wrong in the private sector, there might be some of that, but it'll be less so. so there, and also, you know, most, not all, but most public services are really, really critical to the lives and livelihood, livelihoods of people in a way that maybe an e-commerce brand or, um, you know, maybe slightly less so. Um, and uh, and then the other difference, which I think is important to overcome, is this, uh, you know, the, the the horizon. So, getting things right takes time. Public institutions have been around for a very very long time. Startups have short term horizons and usually need to try and get a return quickly to their investors. And I think there needs to be patience and patient capital that comes with that. And I'm particularly struck, struck you know in, in Rwanda I think there's a, a Rembo uh, works together with the Rwandan government for a 25-year contract to help deliver digitized services and 25 years is a is a long healthy lifespan to try and build those relationships together I mean I, I think there could be some complexities with that because you know how do you bring in other providers and suppliers um, but it's that sense of patience and working together over a long time together to solve problems I think that's where GovTech can be can be most powerful is, is 25 years, that sounds to me like it would be a pretty big outlier in terms of length of procurement contracts. Is, is, that, is that standard or is that kind of at the excessive it, 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 I mean, it's, it's definitely on the longer end. Certainly when you look at things like electronic healthcare records uh, for hospitals across the world, they tend to be 10 years or so. Um, so there, they do have quite a lot of time factored in. But 25 years, I think you're, you're absolutely right, is an outlier on, on that. Right, because I, you would think that in terms of what well, it would make the procurement process even more critical to get right, because unless, you know, unless there's a variety of like opt out clauses on both ends, it seems very difficult to commit for there to be a political decision to commit to a particular, let's say, like contract with a particular provider for 25 years. You have to be pretty confident. Maybe Rwanda, they could be a bit confident about the stability of the, the government. But no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I think you need to build in kind of uh checkpoints where you can exit at either time or change things and you absolutely don't want static monolithic contracts um for you know years and years and years and you do want to bundle it um and, and sort of well disaggregate it into sensible stage points um but i think the commitment there that you know we are willing to work with you if you're willing to work with us for a long time is a really really interesting one and won't always be appropriate uh, and particularly, I don't think it will be appropriate if you're, you know, trying to roll out commodity technology. That that should it should be a lot simpler. Um, but uh, it's something that is is worth thinking about. How do you make sure that the incentives are aligned? And and a lot of those incentives um, really, you know, come down to you know trust and patience. Great. So I think we're about to close in on about an hour. So maybe uh, you could just give us. Uh, for people who are interested in learning a bit more about digital transformation uh, or any of the other things that you've discussed, um, what resources, people, or organizations would you would you point them to to learn a bit more? Yeah. 
But cool. So I, I think the Bennett Institute uh, at Cambridge is a really great place for both public policy generally, but also uh, digital states and digital developments. David Eaves, uh, I think now going to uh, to UCL in London, but was at the Harvard Kennedy School, is a great writer on on digital governments and digital changes. Dr. Tanya Filer, who's also at the Bennett and runs uh, a great uh, outfit called State Up, writes fantastically on digital government. And um, Derek Alton is somebody really good in the in the civic tech community. Um, there's some great conferences like GovCamp, which are pretty global, which I think uh, run. There's mini laterals like the Digital Nations or uh, or the Digital Impact Alliance, which I think are great places to look for. Uh, and podcasts, which I enjoy, Zima Zars, uh, exponential podcast. I think his exponential view is great. Uh, and if you want to book my book, uh, the Practical Guide to Digital Transformation, isn't, isn't a bad place to start either. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Weiss, for joining us. And I won't I won't keep you any longer. Uh, but thank you again to our audience for um, engaging with our content. And please do like and subscribe. And I hope that everyone has uh, a safe, happy and healthy and productive day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.